What's happening, y'all? This is Todd Wilson with another episode of Elevate Your Game. Today, we have husband, father, business owner, uh, performance extraordinaire, nutritionist. Uh, he does a lot. He just develops the human body all the way around. Adam Quinter. Welcome to the show. My guy. Thank you for Appreciate coming, you. Man. Absolutely. So, we love to start this show off with the wall of hoop movies. Oh, yes. Your favorite yes, hoop yes, movie yes. of all time and why. And if it's not up there, there's a couple we missed. Uh, Rebound with Martin Lawrence, um, Just Right with Common and Queen Latifah. But uh, you know, you have there. You have most of the, the films that, that I grew up on, which it, it's hard to say which one's my favorite because I, I have uh, ties to Blue Chips and I have ties to Above the Rim for two totally separate reasons. Let's hear them both. Um, I think what Blue Chips is, you know, when we grew up, um, it's funny because this story is super relevant now, just with like right. NIL and stuff. Right. Like that movie would never be made now, right. you know, because it was all about, you know, taking money under the table and and it, show, it really showed you how like college life could be. And um, I think growing up, seeing that movie, everybody in our era wanted to go to college and play right you know what i mean yes. like that that was the movie where it's like dang that's how it is okay <laughs> like I, I would love to experience something like that going against indiana so um when i was in high school i went to a, a bob knight camp and so like i put the ties together you know mm -hmm. kind of so um great movie and and obviously it has nba stars in it so you can't like right. replace the the playing and the acting because mm -hmm. like usually in these films like you can either act or you can play right? right and like this film was a little bit of both how they directed it, it was great um, yeah. but uh above the rim is more like it reminds me of, of my neighborhood i grew up in um where every, it, everything was basketball and the community center and uh, it just brings me back to like to home and um Pac was my favorite rapper so uh, when he did that film you know, I could relate to it a lot because I love the soundtrack. So I listen to the soundtrack like over and over. Um, but yeah, my dad's from New York. So, you know, like the Rucker Park feel yep. um, with that movie as well. Yep. Like it, it brings me back to, to visiting New York and, and things like that. Absolutely. So that, I think I probably watched Above the Rim more, but Blue Chips was definitely like on the radio too. All right, yeah. so if you had to choose one, are you going to be Kyle Lee Watson? Or are you going to be, uh, what's Penny Hardaway's character? Yeah, pro it? Probably Watson. Yeah. Because I was more of like a dog, a, sh a shorter player. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, Absolutely. Uh, these guys were like dream players. Like, <laughs> yeah, they're all 6'9 and, and, you know. Shagged, yeah. yeah, yeah. No. So. And Both Nick Nolte. Movies. Oh, oh, man. Was the, he was the best depiction of a coach. You yeah. Know? Absolutely. So. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Always great hoop, hoop movies. So, moving yeah. right along, when did you fall in love with basketball? Um... I guess, you know, in the crib, my dad was a scout, so, you know, I still have pictures. I got to show you some of those pictures where I'm in the crib with the ball just like this, you know, yeah. small ball like this. And, um, so I, I'm sure very early. I, from when I can remember, I, was always had, I always had a ball in my hand or dribbling a ball. So um, probably very, very young, three, four. Wow, so you, you grew know, up playing in like basketball rec leagues and all those different um, things, or when did you start actually playing? I did. Um, I would say, you know, my stepdad, he, I always remember him coaching me. So like from five probably, you know, I was already in all the, the rec leagues and he was always the coach. You know, he'd bring all my friends together and, yep. and assemble a team. <laughs> So we grew up playing like that. We had like the same team for forever, just like uh, DeVerl and Cody and all them. Like, yeah. We just had a team that like we had forever. And that you guys played and with them through middle school, high school? And middle school. Middle school. So yeah. I, I, I grew up in um, a low income area um, and I went through elementary through middle school. I got in a lot of trouble uh, because of just the area was not good and um, like I, my parents were always working and things like that. So I stayed in basketball, but I was always like just out doing things because my, my parents weren't really home. They were at work. So I was always with my friends. We were always doing crazy stuff. 
um, but we are always at the courts. You know, like we'll always end up either at a, there's a place in Tempe called Escalante Center, um, or just outside on the on the blacktop. Yeah. Like we always ended up there, even if we were like getting in trouble or whatever. We we'll always end up there at night, and just we would play all night. And um, and I'll never forget those days. Those were like in middle school. Um, all, all the the pros would come in the summer there mm. to that center, which was like out of the blue because in Tempe, like it's, it's sort of by ASU, okay. by Arizona State, but um. It was just a court that was always open, so the pros loved that. You know, it's like oh, they so. could just come and play. So we would end up playing against them, you know, and and that's how where I really fell in love with the games, probably at that center. Gotcha. Um, what, now that I look back, this? it's like, man, we you can't get us out of there. You know, mm -hmm. what I mean, they had a pool, they had ping pong tables, and all these things, and but we were on the court all day, obviously. But um, and all those guys would come visit, so. Uh, we were always watching them, playing, trying to play against them, and even when we get our brains beat in. <laughs> but um, you got to play against them. Yeah, got to compete. Yeah. And this is in middle school, high school, what age is that? That was like person? middle school, high school. Gotcha. High school, um, obviously I didn't spend every day there um, because what happened was I, I got in some trouble over in that area, but we won the championship in middle school. Like, we were really good. We were like heritage, like middle school. Okay. And um, so... I got recruited from uh, Mountain Point, which is in Phoenix. It's about 30 minutes from where I lived. And so my my mom ended up like calling my dad, like, I think we need to like put him over there. And so um, I had the best coach in Arizona when I went. And um, it's funny because I got there. I always tell this story. It's like, yeah, I was recruited there. And then like I got there, I was the worst player on the whole team you know what i mean like the i was probably the second worst player on our freshman team and um i feel like that gave me the extra like edge that my freshman coach was a military guy mm -hmm. and so he he was just drill drill shit out of us. <laughs> and uh I'll, I'll never forget like just showing up and be like wow they really recruited like from everywhere mm -hmm. and um it was kind of like a melting pot and we ended up i ended up getting really doggy from from that coach um because i wasn't stepping on the floor unless i was like winning every race or you know he would just bring everything out of me do and, you um, do you take what what like how you grew up and getting in trouble and you know in a different area and taking that to high school do you think that has something to do with you connecting bringing that dog out of you yeah i think so and i think i honestly think they knew that because they recruited city kids Yep. So, you know, when we showed up, it was like, you know, these are the guys that are on the team and these are you guys, hmm. you know, like beat their brains in every day. Yeah. And like we were always on the second team, you know, type of thing. Like, yeah, you guys should go to the second team. And like, <laughs> but we would just kick their butts like physically. Yeah. You know, back then it was more like a Tough, physical yep. game and okay. like, you know, like you're getting no le easy layups, like taking you out type of thing. So. And, and that particular coach loved that type of basketball. He's like, you know, charges and, you know, um, raking people. Like, you're going to foul him? Foul him. Like, yeah. I, don't want, I don't want, like, this ticky tack stuff, and then they get an and one, you know. And, and he would drill all this stuff in us, like, three on two, two on ones. He's like, we're, like, messing each other up. Nice. And, um, it. and so it brought the dog out of all of us, and by the time you knew it, the the team that's from that area which is very like uh preppy area we had a lot of like you know um athletes kids on the team and stuff mm -hmm. like that um actors kids and and they ended up being tougher because of our group yeah so awesome. then you know we kind of meshed that way and we built it up into you know my junior senior year we were like the best team ever made in Arizona history. What was the skills training and development on the basketball side like then? Um, was it all focused on like team setting and you kind of grew out of that or were you guys doing individual skills drills and stuff? Like I think that? I think they did a great job with the development from a coach standpoint because like that <clears throat> that particular coach was like the drill sergeant mm -hmm. and it brought out the dog in it, all of us. And then when we moved into like I even played JV, right? So my sophomore year I moved into JV, and we had a coach that was like, all right, I'm going to get you in shape. 
Like, we're going to run the hell out of you every single day until, like, you guys have no problems with, you know, running the ball the whole game. Mm. And um, and then they started to put in the structure, which is, it was great because it came from two legendary coaches, which is Coach Bennett, he, he was at Gilbert High School, and then my coach is Sam Ballard. They came from the same system. Mm. So um, that system was from Coach Yuri, which is from East High School, which is in Phoenix, and the old heads will know who this guy is, but he was a scout in it for the Atlanta Hawks. Um, he coached on every level. And he coached, um, my coach for sure, I can't remember if, if Bennett was there too, but he lo- learned that coaching system. So it was kind of like one of those things where it was like, um, where it was Duke, like pass, cut away, mm-hmm. um, very structured. And they drilled that as in us from day one. Wow. And I'll never forget like all those drills that we did. We did it from my freshman year all the way to my senior year. We would come in and we'd do these specific drills that were working our our levels like on the floor, our mm-hmm. angles, passing, yeah. um, defensive drills. Like we had all these drills that we would do every single day. And it was like for like an hour. So we would have... Um, we would have this open class at the end of the day. It was, I think it was like one to two o'clock. And we would go and we'd just do all development. Yep. And like that, I see it a lot now. Yep, but like systems. back then, like you would see that um, on every team and it would be more of a team thing. Now it's more of like a skill thing. Yes. You know? Yep. And so it was like just skills. Like we did do that, some of that stuff, but it was more in a team setting. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's what you were getting at. Yeah, no. But like, um, it, it made us play together though. Like, I, I'll never forget those drills because like, we were one unit. Yep. You, know? you guys By all the, did it from the time you stepped in to the time you left. And so that's what all you guys knew. You thought that was the correct way to play basketball. Yes. And that's what's missing, I think, from a development standpoint yes. around the whole basketball scene now is that everybody's so focused on their individual skills that they're not learning basketball yeah. fundamentals. And I, I think it's important to see that that stuff has a big impact over time. If you, Huge. And I think everybody's trying to win games and, no, develop the players in a right. team setting, right? And you can still do your individual skill stuff, but I think they that should be a focus. I think they saw that, and I'll just cut you off, but I mm-hmm. think they saw that early on. It was like, um, this guy's a... The drill side. This guy's gonna get you in shape. So then, when you hit varsity, like you're gonna have all these components mm-hmm. that that you're gonna need, as well as when we see you're ready, you're ready. Like the end yeah. of my sophomore year, they moved me up, um, but I was more of like a combo. But I had to figure out how to play point guard. So like the whole my whole sophomore year is just like giving me the ball, let me make mistakes. You know, setting up an offense. Um, I was always a really good defender because I was like, I was the dog on the team, you know, like yep. I just wanted to like beat your brains in from my mm-hmm. freshman coach. He's, he's the one that like drilled that into me, but because I was small like him too. And so, but once I learned how to play point guard, that's when they brought, finally, like they brought me up. They're like, okay, I, I can, I could see him starting now, but he, I would have to go against the, the starters at the time. And they were just like, kill me, mm-hmm. you know, cause they were older than me. And they were really good too. They right. had one, I think they went to the championship the year that I, before I got brought up. So like, we had really, really good development, really, really good coaching system. Uh, my coach was in the NBA for 17 years. Um, so you guys, yeah, around. Real, I was real around, hoopers, real hooping people. I was around really good basketball people. Yeah. And Coach Year, he's a legend in Arizona. He's probably the best, one of the best coaches in Arizona history. Um, and uh, I think that translated big time because he would always come to the practices. And, like, we always want to impress him, too. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. like, he would always come back. He was in his probably 60s, 70s at the time. Um, he's 80s, 90s. He's probably in his 90s now, I wow. bet. Yeah. It's, uh, so the dog, you keep on talking about, hey, you were a dog. The, you know, that freshman coach put that dog in you. What yeah. were his his the drills or what what did he do to bring that dog out of you? If you had a kid who's a freshman now, yeah. who's you know undersized for basketball, yeah. right? Because there's a lot of us out there who are under six three. I feel that's undersized now in basketball. Yeah. What would you tell them 
um, as far as bringing the dog out? What would they have to do? Or a coach who has kids, yeah. what does that look like? Um, I think with him, he would, there's not a time that I remember him not saying something. Like um, any mistake that was made, like he was in your grill, in your ass, you know? And like, I think that that part is like, it's more like a scare ta tactic, but at the same time, it's like, you know, he cares. Mm -hmm. yep. So like, I would run her through a wall for that guy because I knew that he cared so much. And um, the instruction, the um, like, say I didn't, say I didn't uh, uh, close out as hard as I should, like I'm kind of doing it half-ass, like he'd be, in your butt, he would yell at you. Like back then, like the coaches would grab your shirt, you know, they would <laughs> right. grab your neck, like, like put you in the spot. Coaches don't like, do that today. You go yeah, to jail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's but like yes. not, it's not a thing now, but right. like, it was more of like, um, like your father figure. Yeah. And then he'd be like, after he's done yelling, you can get on the line too. Mm -hmm. You know, like there was always a consequence to like what you did. Extreme accountability, real extreme, accountability. Extreme, extreme. Yeah. Like, um, and then he, he was the type of guy like, um, if you're late, like you're going to run all practice or you're going to do uh, push-ups till you can't anymore. Um, he was like, did that anybody guy. ever quit? Um, or there did was, everybody respond to it? How did everybody respond? To there, it? there was a few times where like people wanted to walk out, but I think that the, the way that the coaching structure was there was like be together, be one unit, be, that's what the beauty of all of those drills that we were talking about. It's like, mm -hmm. um, we were a family first. And so, um, we had a lot of kids coming in from other places. So like all we had was each other mm -hmm. and I was kind of smart. I thought, yeah, no, um, great. and so at first it was it's us culture. against them, but then at at some point, it's like, okay, I'm playing for you too. Like, yeah. um, now, now you're kicking my butt. You're, you're fouling me. Oh, yeah, like, so, for instance, his name was Coach Mo. I'll never forget him. But um, he would have this vein that came out of his <laughs> neck because he was yelling so much. He would go hoarse. Um, and, uh, yeah, he would, he would yell at you, and his, this vein would come out of his neck like that. And you're like, oh, shit, here comes the vein. The vein's coming out. He must be really mad. He would get red, red. He was about five, six, five, oh, seven. Man. He's yelling at you like this. Like, That's when my junior college coach was like that. It reminds guy me of Cronin. Uh, you know how he's like yelling up at you? <laughs> yeah. Like that. And, uh, but yeah, I, I think the extreme accountability where like, if, if your foot didn't move the right way on defense, he was in like immediately. And, um, and I think, you know, it was like one of those practices where it's like, all right, we're not even getting through practice because he's just every single thing. He was like a perfectionist. Yeah. I think it's a military thing. Mm -hmm. He's a perfectionist and every little thing he would see, he would stop practice. And like, you're like, oh, crap, I hope it's not me. You know what I mean? How does that discipline then impact you now running your own business and having a family? Yeah, I think I was, we were talking about earlier, it's like, um, you can always tell a player, like, the way they show up, mm -hmm. or, like, you know, if they're late, if they're, um, how they do their work, how they work out, um, do they take it really seriously, are they asking questions, um, and I think all those things, um, from that coach, uh, as far as, uh, perfectionism, um, I'm very like that with my work. I'm very like that with my systems and how, how each individual player, um, has a different workout or has a different plan. Um, there's so many different players out there, right? Yeah. It's like, it may not be a mental thing. It may be a physical thing or vice versa. And you kind of got to find the, the tape, you know, and, and go after what they're bad at, you know? And that's yeah. my whole goal. Uh, when I approach training and I think that was his goal as well. It's like, yeah. all right, what are you bad at? I want to bring that out of you. Yep. And so that you affect the game. Yep. Um, a lot, of, full lot of behavior correction <clears throat> and discipline and, and showing you, hey, this is how you get results. So right. you said you have one of the best high school teams in Arizona. Yeah. Um, so you, how many, uh, you said you had nine guys that went to visit or play yeah. college ball? Yeah, played college. Yeah, yeah. Nine, nine yeah. guys on one team. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, it was in the Tribune, like, uh, with our picture, you know, like, um, 
best team ever assembled in Arizona history. I'll never forget that that line. And uh, I had we had guys that, that went to St. Mary's, ASU, Vanderbilt, all these teams. And um, but no matter what, like there was nobody above the team. Yeah. On the on those teams. That's how you that's how you do that. that I think you saw that a lot in the, I'm assuming this is the early 2000s, mm -hmm. right? So um, you see that um, there's Campbell Hall out here. They yeah. had 11 guys go to college when Drew and Justin yes. Holiday were yes. there. And uh, Taft had one team that had 15 guys go Division One and Two mm -hmm. um, in those early years. So I think that was the thing. Now it's like, oh, yeah, we want to make super teams, but only three or four college-level guys are on the team where yeah. before there was a, a patience in no, development for sure. and a patience with, hey, all of us can make it to where we want to go if we do this together. Yeah. And um, I think that's lost in, yeah. in Southern California for sure. It's lost in you getting playing time, being on varsity right. as a freshman and, you know, wanting the ball when college coaches are going to find you if you're a great basketball player regardless. They're going to find you, man. Yep. And like, uh, I think we we're also talking about this, like, how, how are you going to affect the game? You know, yeah. like everybody can score now and shoot and they got all these combos and and all these things but do they do they play defense you know consistently yeah. um do they have mood swings yeah. like the mental stuff the men toughness and the, the mental stuff is huge um are you gonna are you gonna go after loose balls how's your plus minus like yeah. all these things are, are huge when you, when it comes to um, i think i was looking at this stuff early because of my father as a scout mm -hmm. but um, i think Knowing that um, these kids now, knowing that, is probably going to improve what they do. Yeah. Um, looking at these advanced uh, stats. And um, I think back then, even, you know, we had, I don't know if you remember these, but we had philosophy. Yes. Like, so we would go into, like, 20 minutes of, like, basketball philosophy. Our coaches had us do that. Yeah. And it's like, okay, like, who made the basketball hoop and... Like, um, yeah. Nobody like all these can say who, stuff. who created basketball. I, we should, right. I'm gonna start asking kids that we should start asking kids that who yeah. invented basketball and when yeah. was invented and like the where, history of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> and like you know, like we were talking about like coaches, we'll do that later, but like John Wooden, where he had like theory yes. and all this stuff, like, like it was a classroom for basketball, yeah. And um, I think it's dramatically um, lost now. Mm -hmm because I don't think any of those kids know any of the history no. about anything. No, they don't even know who, like, Eric Snow is, who was, like, right. an integral part of a Philadelphia team that made it right. to the finals. Like, they don't know who yeah. that guy Who? Like, yeah. is that from a yeah. movie? Like, wait. But, um, no, I what think... What about uh, studying film, too? Like, we I study film. We thing. study film. I, I think, um, I think within high school, the coaches do. Yeah. Most of them. Yeah. The good ones. You yeah, can, tell, you can one. tell who study films. You, you can tell because of how they make adjustments during games. Right. Um, I think Southern California basketball is so elite as far as the talent level mm -hmm. that you have to study film or you're going to get smacked. Right. Regardless of the talent that you have. Because right. a smarter coach can beat a team like yeah. that. But And with so much talent here, um, you would have to. But I, I meant from more of like a, a player standpoint. Like when we when we grew up, we had the VHS. Yeah. I don't. I don't know what you grew up yeah. on, but I had VHS, mm -hmm. um, and I just remember winding those tapes over and over and over. Yeah. And then I would go out to the yard. Yes. No, they don't know, do that. Go, go out to the they court. They have YouTube, so they go, they go YouTube, right? They go YouTube and watch highlights and try yeah. moves and, yeah. and try to do you know uh -huh. the Steph Curry step back or whatever it is. So that it's it's similar. I think we watched it a little different. We watched it trying to understand the game. Yes. Where they're trying yes. to understand a move. That, the that's game. what I was getting at. Yeah. It's that. like, it's like, uh, why did he do that? Like, I was, I was watching film with one of my clients um, not too long ago because um, he was struggling with pick and roll options and just, like, how to read it and stuff. And I think they're so um, ISO-driven right now that, like, they don't, un they don't understand basketball. Yep. And it's like... Everything is predicated on what the defense is giving you, right? And like trying to put two and two together for them is like, you know, really hard. Yeah. Um, and I think it's just like, oh, he just did that move. Like that. That's why he's open. It's like, nah, he just came off that stagger, really. <laughs> right. And, and he that's read why, where the defender was and the help side was. And now he's read. wide open. Yes. You know. But then they see the combo and they're like, oh, it's because he made that. No, that's not. How. 
that's not how it got open. Yeah. You know, because yeah. when you watch programs, it's way different. It's all predicated on... 100%. Yeah. And and comes from the film study. So, uh, high school, you had this amazing team. So, I'm assuming championships came from that? What happened with the, so, you know... Man, it's still it's still tough to talk about. But um, my junior year, um, I didn't start. I was still under somebody. We had teams that were really really good every year, um, and so I was learning from like the best, you know. And so my junior year though, we we went um, to I want to say semis and quarterfinals. Anyways, we had two back to back buzzer beaters. That you so, lost? No, no, we won. You won. So it was back, like, back yeah, it was like semis or quarters, semis, and then yeah. lost in the championship. Ah. And then the next year, I was telling you, this was like the heartbreaking one, right? Um, is I was in, um, we were in the quarterfinals, and we played a team that scouted us just right, and we played Danny Ainge's kid, hmm. uh, which was really really good back then he went to uh, BYU okay and he's like like one of the best players ever there um he was really really good but they scouted us so every single play we could just t- we could just tell like okay they know every single thing that we're doing on offense whoa so now what's the adjustment we didn't really have an adjustment for it we played spread offense I don't even remember that yeah where you just yep. hold the ball mm-hmm. we never got up though so we couldn't do it so we are literally just running our motion, and they know exactly what we were doing. Uh, we had no counter to it, and uh, they ended up beating us. But I was telling you the story where it was like, that's where I, I that's what I didn't want to feel ever again. Mm-hmm. It was like, okay, I just lost two, you know, years in a row. And this one really hurt. It was my senior year. I was getting recruited by a bunch of teams, and um, I was crying. Like, I was, I'm not a crier. Yeah. I'm still to this day I don't cry at very many things, um, but that I'll never forget that day I was I was like really hurt, and um, I was already a dog at that point in time, but like that took it up to like that was the next level. Mm-hmm. That was like all right, if if you're gonna beat me, like you gotta run through me, yeah. type of thing. Why and, why uh, was that moment so pivotal? I, you kind of discussed it earlier. It wasn't just the loss. But it was also what came after that loss. Yeah, it was like what, what came after the after the, it wasn't the loss. It was, it was um, all those years of preparation in the same system. We were family. The team was family. Um, my father, he didn't really come to a lot of games. He's always on the road scouting. But he was at that game, and I remember crying with him. Um, so that was like a a big deal to me because um, we don't have the best relationship now. But like I remember that moment in time, and uh, and it, it was just sucked, you know. Yeah. And um and I never wanted to feel that way on a basketball court ever again. Yeah. You know, um because my whole family was there because our team was so close knit. Everybody was good. Everybody like we had a chance. And then to watch the the team that we beat two or three times during the year, they won the whole thing. Oh man. And that was tough. Um and we beat um. That year, we also beat, um, th- my junior year, we beat Jared Bayless, oh. which was huge. They won like 50 games yeah, straight like or something. Yeah, 40 a game or something. Yeah, he was, he was ridiculous. I remember that guy. Yeah, and uh, he had a huge tip on his shoulder. He was like one of those guys, too. Yeah. And, uh, and I always remember, like, he, he, I could tell he didn't like to play against me because, <laughs> like, I was just in the whole game. Yeah. Um, still would give you 20-something, you know, like on a bad day. Right, so, right, right. <laughs> um, but uh, the the second year it was like Channing Fry. Oh boy! And um, uh, my senior year we lost to um, another team in Marcos Deniza, and they had um, like probably four kids go to college off that team. And so where I ended up in college, I ended up being with one of those guys too. That's where. So where'd you go to college? What happened? I went to Central to Arizona. Okay. Um, I didn't have the best grades. Uh, that was all on me, so kids, get the grades done because I had a lot of great opportunities for D1s and I couldn't take them because my grades were terrible. Yeah. And, um, you know, even back then, like, I, I just remember, like, how did I even get through that class? Like, I don't know. But um, I think it was, we had such a good team that, that they were just giving us grades, wow. you know. 
and like I wish I was more disciplined to be like okay you know I had like a two seven or something I could have had a three one three two easy probably right if I just tried and like I just wasn't I wasn't nobody was in my ear about it you know and from where I come from like in, in middle school where I, where I was living rough and and the schooling was terrible mm-hmm. you know I was just getting by so when you put me in an even harder school right it was like I was just getting by I was doing the same habits so like I wish I had somebody that like either gave me a tutor or like you know I could reach out to somebody that would help me with school how involved were the coaches on the academic side then I don't that's, that's pretty interesting yeah I don't think they were mm. I don't I literally think the they're teachers great, great were like with basketball and great all that. with basketball <laughs> Um, but they will make sure you're just making it through school so you can mm-hmm. be on the basketball court. You know what yeah, I mean? Like yeah. check, oh, okay, you have C's, all right, you're good to play. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And I think for me specifically, um, you know, I wasn't, you know, my best friend had 20 offers. You know, I had like probably four or five where it was like on the fence. I wish my coaches were like more active in, in that part. Which I give you kudos for because I know you're really active yeah. uh, with that stuff, and th- that could have brought me to to a higher level. But I learned a lot in community college. Community yeah. college is not for everybody. No, it was not. Um, <laughs> and and if you're not gonna survive in community college, there's no way you're gonna survive on any other level. Right. Right. So it's like when I went to community college, I obviously all the best ones wanted me at that point. Like I could reach out to anybody, and they wanted me. So I went to the team that just had one national championship. It's Central Arizona. Mm-hmm. Um, it's in the boonies. There was nothing to do. I picked that for a reason. Like so me so and my dad cool. had that discussion. Like, look, there's nothing out here. Like all you're gonna do, you're gonna eat, sleep, shit, basketball. Mm-hmm. And I took that as a challenge. I got there. We had, uh, I'll never forget. I showed up, we had four point guards. Oh, four. Love competition. <laughs> three of them, three of them were from East Coast. So I had like one person was from uh, um, New York. No, two of them are from New York. And they were just, they, they were incredible ball handlers. Right. Um, they were dogs too, just like me. And then the other one was from Plainfield, Jersey. Mm. And he was a little guy like me. So like me and him were competing all day. Um, and so my dad was like, you know, he, he's been in basketball his whole life. He's like, look, you got four point guards. Like all of you are battling out for a spot, nothing's guaranteed, red shirt. I'm like, okay, cool. I was, he was like, you got good mentors, they just won the championship. Right, right. Right. Some of these guys, like, you're gonna take their coaching, you're gonna practice every single day with the, whoever's the, the guy that drills the most, you're going with him, and that's it. And that's all I did for the whole year. Um, so I did, uh, this is what I, I wished most kids were like now, but. Um, we were doing two a days in the weight room, two a days on the court, on the court yeah. and practice. That's five workouts in one day, and I did that for a whole year straight. Oh, wow. And then I took, I carried that into my next season. Like I went to MCC, it was by my house, um, and I did that for a reason. It was like I'm getting away from that uh, program that where they had all the point guards. I played really good, actually. I probably would have started. But the team that was assembled was by Alton Lister. He was like a legendary oh, NBA yeah. player. Yeah. And so that team was way better. And I was going to start. He's like, I'm, give, I'm giving you the ball. I'm giving you the keys. And I didn't know what he was meant at that point in time uh, because I was too young. It, it like went over my head. But mm-hmm. years later, I'm like, man, I really did have the keys. Like <laughs> Nobody actually let me go. I was a set it up point guard back then. Right, right, right. And so, like, you don't really see that that much these days. Like, every point guard can go get it now. Mm -hmm. But back then, like, the set up point guard, for people that don't know it, is like, all right, I'm going to pass, move away, and if I come off a screen, I'm shooting if I'm open. Right? Right? It's not like ISO, like AI. The aggressive, you play make, and you're the focal point. It's like, okay, you're in the wrong spot, get out. Like, okay, the screen across, like, for the for the center i'm dumping it down you know like things like that yeah and then like i'm the third option fourth option on the team and when i showed up to that college in in particular Mm -hmm. i had an nba coach like seasoned nba coach that will let you go 
Yep. And I just remember him stopping practice one day. He's like, he's like, Adam, you're the fastest person on the court. Why are you not just going to the rim every single time? He's like, you could walk there. He was, he took the ball from me. He's like walking, <laughs> like put it in the hoop, right? And it clicked for me like, oh, he's giving me the keys. Like, like you and me that was my moment. Like, yeah. okay. So then that's when I was like, you know, I was averaging a lot of points um, and assists because I was so aggressive and I was so fast. I didn't even realize how fast I was. But um, I actually went to college for track and basketball, but I quit track. Hooper. But <laughs> on the basketball court, I didn't realize like yeah. how I could use my speed and stuff. And so yeah. he's like, no, I, like if you make mistakes, cool, whatever. Like it's about you. Like you can go now. Like he's waiting and waiting, waiting. So like half the, halfway through the season, that that's when it clicked. Though. He's like walking to the rim, like literally, <laughs> he lays it up. But um, but yeah. So like, I brought the Central Arizona stuff with me though. It was like I'm doing work after five it. days. Yeah. And I'm playing now. So now I'm playing practice two a days in both. Um, I had shooting routines. I, I had the best three point shooting percentage in the country. So like yeah. I was really shooting the piss out of the ball, and um. And then that's when I got hurt. I got hurt like um, three months in, in, oh wait, wait, no. It was like two months into my last season. Um, and it was my third year. So it was your sophomore year because you did a red shirt. So this is your sophomore year. Junior three year. I, I went into my junior year. You went into your junior year. Two okay. years into my junior year. And I'm shooting the lights out. I'm leading, yeah. I'm leading the, literally lead the league in threes and, um, you know, I had 43 inch vertical. Like there, there was no way you, you wouldn't see me on the court. You know. No. So. And I played defense. Uh, we got to talk about this because you're one of the top performance trainers now. Yeah. So when did performance training? When did you get introduced to that? And when did you know that that was a serious part of the game? Well, I was in in high school actually. I had I had an injury like, you know, just like one of ankles or something mm -hmm. like something easy. Like I had 30 ankle sprains probably each side. Right. But like it was one of those where my pops actually took me to the to the arena uh, one day. He came from out of town, brought me. He's like meet Aaron Nelson, and Aaron Nelson is like he's known as like one of the best strength yeah. coaches. Like this is when Phoenix was like they were on leading the league as far as injury prevention, injury prevention. and all yeah. that good stuff. Yeah, yeah. that's Aaron Aaron Nelson Got is it. his name. He was the top of it, and um. I met him and I got to watch Steve Nash train mm -hmm. and he had an ankle, same thing as me. I think it was an ankle and, um, and he was showing me his rehab uh, workouts and it was all really directed toward like PT, mm -hmm. which I had never seen before. It was like, you know, back, back when we play, it was all about like lifting yep. heavy, Olympic, heavy Olympic squats, lifts, yep. like I'm squatting <laughs> 500 pounds and all this stuff. But when I saw that, he's like standing on rollers, he's on Swiss balls on his knees, you know, like all these core activations. And um, I had never seen anything like that before, yeah. before Steve Nash. That was like my favorite uh, thing to watch um, performance. To this day, I just like, I'm like always thinking back like, oh, that's something I would, would have saw Steve do, you know? Yeah. Um, but pelvic floor, you know, teaching him, him how to breathe, all these things like, it's like modern day performance training now, now but back then it was right. everybody's pretty much on at least on the path to yeah. that now but back then it was like nobody's doing that Man. and so that kind of introduced me but later on in my fast forward later on in my career i went to mexico played and then i tore my knee in actually it was in an off season um i played a couple years tore my knee in the off season. And when I was going through the PT process, it brought me back to that moment mm. when I saw Steve stuff. And I'm like, I'm like, wow, I love that. I'm, I'm rehabbing, I'm rehabbing. This was uh, one, one and a half years. I'm not seeing my 43 inch vertical comeback. Um, I'm not seeing um, me in shape like I used to be. Um, and so the, the lights were getting darker and darker and I was like, you know what? I think I could do this like for a living, mm -hmm. um, because I was doing the PT and then I was starting to go on YouTube. That's when YouTube came out. Yeah. So I'm going on YouTube. We're like, old guys. Yeah. Yes. We were there when YouTube started. Right. Yes. <laughs> and so 
I started learning all these new tricks right. that could potentially fix my knee. So that was very like light bulb, you know? And then, um, so I'm, I'm working on myself. And then I took a job at Equinox. I moved to California. Oh, okay. Took a job at Equinox. Which one? To train. West LA. Was that okay? Yep. I worked at the Woodland Hills one. What years were you there at you Equinox? Go. I was at Equinox, shoot, 2012, 11. Uh, okay. Yeah, I was there 2000. Yep. Like no, wait, wait, no, even earlier. Yeah, probably, yeah, probably like 2011. I've been here a while now. I've already, we probably worked with the company around the same time. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, anyways, but we had a basketball court. That's why yeah. I took that job. Um, so I, I was working on court with pe- with guys, like overseas guys, high school guys, um, and I was doing their weight training at the same nice. time. And then I started to do part-time PT. So mm. I started working at a PT office. Got it. And and then that's when all this stuff started connecting. Like, wow, I'm helping so many people. Like, that's awesome. And that was way more rewarding than money could ever be. And and I was and I was making more money than I would overseas anyway. Yeah. So at that point in time, I'm like, well, I'm not in shape, so this is what I'm going to do for now. And it ended up being like that rabbit hole where it's like I actually love this yeah. and I love like developing people. I love taking somebody from like ground zero to like the mountaintop, you know. How and intentional I, did you become um, to become a therapist and become a trainer? Like how intentional were those actions? It sounds like it was a very natural progression for you because of, you know, your injury and all that. But how intentional did you become about becoming one of the best during that time? Um, I think um, I kind of was seeing the culture change um, from like, you know, heavy weight lifting or, or power lifting to functional training. Yeah. So when it started to go that direction, I could just see where I was helping guys come in and they would all have like nicks and necks and injuries, especially overseas guys. Like they always had something, right? Yeah. And I would end up helping them fix it. And they were like, wow, my pain's gone and stuff like that. And that's where I became like obsessive with like um, my research, um, data collection. Like, you know, my programs are very intensive and I watch every single number um, when it comes to like biomechanics and all these things. So um, I think at that point in time though, Equinox, when I was going through, you know, their whole system, I went all the way up to the very, very top of where you can go as a trainer. Tier four? <laughs> yes, yes, like, and, yep. and master trainer. Yep. And, like, I was learning from all the best PTs and trainers in the world. Wow. Like, they were bringing in people that I still call them mentors to this day, um, that are scientists, that are, um, you know, top of the food chain and PT. Uh, there's a couple of them out here. Um, but when you work with those type of people, you're like, wow, like I'm like this low, you know what I mean? (laughs) It's like, I I know very little. And then I spend a month with one of them too. And now you're just going up a level, going up. It's like if you were in basketball, right. And you're, you're training with your high school coach to be a point guard. And then CP comes in the room and then he's like, this is what you do. You go like the levels are just different, Yeah, you know? So so that's kind of what I was doing with training. So that you, I was learning from the best people. That that's it. So your mentors and the people you were learning from, and your intention about learning from the best, yes, is what that, raised your ceiling and your lid to be the trainer that you are today. Yeah. I think that's important for people to see and hear that it's not magic. Like you know, you don't just say, "Hey, I'm going to do this," and it happens. Yeah. Or I'm just be on the court, like you're saying. I'm not, I'm just going to be on the court with my trainer, mm-hmm. who has a certain lid on them and what they know in their experience you got to keep on seeking that higher level higher level and um to become the best at what you do especially for the kids who you want to be a college level player you should probably go with somebody who develops college players right and nba players absolutely um because you're not not saying it's impossible but you have a better opportunity to learn where you want to go right you know from those i don't know i think we get it from sports too is like you know in basketball, I was in it for so long, but like I always wanted to be the best, um, just because of my the progression of it, you yeah. know, and like the coaches that I had and all these things. It's like once you get to a level, you're like you get a, a smell of it, 
you're like, ooh, that's a big yeah. thing, you know? And then, like, with these guys, though, it was a, a totally different realm, even. And they were using doctorate terms and, and all these things. I'm like, man, I want to speak like that one day. Yeah. You know, it, it became not about basketball anymore. Mm. And, like, so that's when I started playing less and studying more and getting more into, you know, anatomy and, and those things and, and learning from these guys and guys and girls, but mostly guys that kind of pointed me into the direction of, like, you want to work with the best, you have to be the best. Yeah. Like, you can't just, like, yep. go work with the best and be mediocre. Like, and so that was always my goal is to help as many people as I could, and that's why I'm still in high school sports now. It's like... It's not really about the money. It's about really developing kids, and yes. and hopefully one day they can get to their dreams. You know, like yeah. like me and you. I know when I was a kid, I wanted to be in the NBA. Oh, for sure. And there's a lot of people out there that that do. Mm -hmm. But in my opinion, like now that I look back at it, I still really am. It's, I'm working <laughs> with NBA players. Yeah. I'm working around it all the time. Um, obviously, my father, he's always been around it. So, like, I've always been around it, but I still, I'm working within yes. that realm. So, like, people that don't make it, like, that's the on, not the only way, yeah. you know? Like, you can be a, an analyst. You can be a scout. You can, there's so many different jobs within it. Um, consulting, like, that's what I do. Yeah. I consult, but there's what so many different things. What does consulting mean? What does that mean exactly? I think that's important because yeah. you see that a lot, right? Yeah. What, what aspects of the game do you consult with that keep you connected to the game? Performance. So, yeah. so I would, t I would, if a team com comes in and hires me, um, I basically go in and I break down their systems. Like, what are you using when it comes to your weight training program? What are you using when it comes to your PT program? Programming, not yes. just like, like throwing some stuff together for a team to work out, but like, okay, Paul George is hurt. Like, what does your system look like with his rehab and, like. How are you guys communicating? This is huge yes. uh, when it comes to PT, performance, coaching. Mm -hmm. There's so many different uh, roles within the actual team that, like, sometimes not, one of them doesn't know what's going on. Right. So, like, them communicating, um, like, the PTs uh, say, you know, there's something going on in his foot. So, now trainer, you're the trainer, um, we need to do this lightly. Um, don't aggravate that foot because he might not be available for next week, right? Right, And then the trainer having to relay or the PT having to relay that to the coach. Right. And the coach is like, he's going to play either way, you know? <laughs> right. And then, right. And then you're having this foot. conversation of <laughs> yeah. like, so all those things go into consulting. Yeah. And then like, you know, the actual um, systems that they're using, which come from, you know, it could come from any coach in the world, but um, there's certain systems that we use. Like I use for, for lifting, I use uh, a system that comes out of uh, West Coast Barbell, and like that's Louis Simmons. So that, like I do a conjugate system where everything just continuously changes. The, the mind um, learns how to connect uh, the weight room to the basketball court mm. better because it's able to adapt. So mm -hmm. when you're doing a lot of different workouts, your body constantly has to adapt. Yep. yep. So if you're doing that, that translates immediately to the court. Wow. Um, and then when, when I come to like PT, I'm using stuff from Andy Barr that I've learned. Um, all these great PTs that I've learned stuff from. Yeah. But, um, but you've developed it, your own. From all these great people, you've developed a system that you're producing yes. the athletes at a yes. kind of, a, I, I want to say, a faster rate and a productive rate. Um, yes. You, yes. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, like the guys that he works with, you rarely see injuries, and, or if you do, they bounce back pretty quick. Yeah. And then if you have someone yeah. who is new to your system, they get pretty athletic fairly quickly as well. Very fast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, knock on wood, I haven't had a major injury under my watch. You're the first person to knock on this wood. That's yeah. hilarious. But that is love that you haven't had a major injury. That's Never. I think that that's yeah. important. So for the kids who are coming up, you know, middle school, high school, what are four of the most important factors you think they should focus on in their performance development? This is where I was getting at with like um, consulting is like, how are you teaching habits? That's like the biggest thing uh, on the spectrum right now, uh, because, like you said, what are what are the main things? Like, 
that make a player better it's not necessarily like the weight room it may be like mental mm. so i always i always think of you know yoga meditation is is going to be my you know my thing probably forever that um players will come in and if i do it with with you yoga or meditation you, you it might change you like in the perspective and the way you think about life and and those sorts of things but i think that that's a big shift in habit right okay. because you're slowing your mind down you're slowing your body down um if you look at somebody like lebron i always bring lebron up because he's he's never like too much emotion yep. like up and down and never all that high, never too low no yeah. he's not like draymond right where he's yeah. like blows up or mm -hmm. like he's always just even kill the whole game doesn't matter the moment mm -hmm. um but you can tell that he meditates you know yeah. he's relaxing his body in some way to where it's supernatural on the court that's one huge component okay. i think and with the games and the phones the kids are always on it's spiking you know your system your nervous system yeah. so you're gonna have a higher heart rate um, and when you do um, yoga meditation it brings your heart rate down you calm down um, you burn fat way easier um, your mind can think better there's just so many things that 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 does yeah. um, not only just stretching but like mentally um, I would say the other habit would be um, changing diets um, right now, I hate AAU because the kids will go away and they'll eat junk food all weekend and then they come back to me and they're really, really stiff and tight, yeah. um, their muscles that is, and um, I noticed that you can't make a whole lot of progress when they're eating like that because it dehydrates their body, um, they can't get their proper recovery, um, so many hormonal issues like uh, mood swings um, what kind of food should they be eating on uh, AAU trip I always I always say whole foods best right yeah. but like when you go on AAU where are you gonna find whole foods yeah right or can they make it at home and prepare and bring it so like for the families who are committed to this there's not a lot but there are you know I know of some maybe 10% mm -hmm. of the kids who come through our program they they do listen to the nutrition advice so if i have a kid who is going on, on an aau tournament mm -hmm. um and they could prepare a lunch at home mm -hmm. what so whole foods so just healthy organic foods doesn't matter what that food is as they're yes. playing game to game so yeah. yes and like you know i became a master nutritionist because of this it, it got so bad that i was like this is something where i need to know everything about it um when it comes to whole foods make sure that um, there's a list if you go online you can find these lists of like um, what kind of fruits and vegetables that you can cook what you can't cook because different mm. heats will mess with the ph levels all kinds of stuff i mean it's like a deep dark uh, <laughs> black hole when it comes to yeah. nutrition but i would always look on the back of the box like you probably heard it a million times right all the ingredients in there make sure you're checking what those ingredients say mm. so it doesn't matter if you go out of town i want you to look at what's actually in the food yeah because there's so much process and so many chemicals that the the i would say the government is putting into our food i think it's a whole population control i'm like conspiracy <laughs> all the way right but um make sure that it it's it says organic or it's it says you know there's no you know, there's literally pesticides, chemicals in some of this stuff. Yeah, right. And so I would say that's a big thing. If you want to do, go go look online. Um, there's tons of information out there about like processed foods. Um, I would definitely, if you're going to to a store, look for the organic fruits and vegetables section um, because they throw pesticides on top of those too. So when it's processing through your body, you're getting chemicals. Mm -hmm. um, make sure you're washing your stuff like all the time, meats especially too. Yeah. Make sure you wash them. Um, there's just so many Man. things we can go down, but when you're on a road trip, another thing that's great is powders. You know, like people don't um, use like supplements a lot. I noticed like, especially in this era, like if they have any free time, they're just on their phone. Yeah. So like if we can get them just to pick up like a green powder, Yeah. you know, they just put it in water or yeah. put it in the, some type of you know mixture where it doesn't taste so bad 
like that's huge mm -hmm. that's like at least you're getting your fruits and vegetables with a drink right you know you don't even have to think about it you just dump a scoop done right or electrolytes during games like nobody does that yeah. right that's huge like that will take your body from like everything is hurting in a game you put the electrolytes in nothing is hurting wow this like is such something is so simple <laughs> Right, and, they, and you do that think about when it. you're actively playing, or do you do it be before the game? Or no, both? intra, intra yeah. workout. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. There's supplements for both, right? Okay. But um, also there's another um, thing online for supplements for obviously if you got kids and, and their parents are watching, like there's another thing where you can literally type the product in, as a, from a supplement standpoint, and it will show you if it's banned. Right. Or Make sure any, you're supposed any to band be yes. stuff is in it. Um, can they, and they can get all this information from you as well. On yeah. The yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. reach out to them. Yeah. Very you can always reach guy. out to me. So, yeah. <laughs> I would say that's the second thing. And then the third thing is like the recovery. Ah. If you're an AAU kid, that's really good. And you're trying to get ranked and all this stuff. And you have to play a million games. Talk about right? it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, didn't you just play last weekend uh, seven games and now you're going to go play seven more? Like yes. this weekend. Can I give a little commercial break on that? Because this is very important that these parents understand, especially with middle school, your kids should not be playing every weekend. There's no college coaches watching. Every tournament is competitive nowadays because all these teams play in the same tournaments over and over. And your exposure only matters to the point that your kid is getting the, I guess, acknowledgement of being a high level player in middle school. But that all resets when you go to high school. Mm -hmm. And so I just want the parents to hear this. Like if your team is playing every single weekend, they're getting money from you. That is their purpose. And yeah. Club coaches, let's talk about it. Because yeah. there's no reason that these kids should be playing seven, eight games in a weekend mm -hmm. and then going to practice two days a week and then expecting to function as, as young kids. Yeah. Uh, there's a balance to that. So really monitor that and go with programs who understand this mm -hmm. and um, programs if you don't understand why it's not important to not play every weekend please call me talk to me because we're hurting our youth at the end of the day overuse mm -hmm. injuries not recovering not eating properly and spending these families money like for nothing almost in my opinion mm -hmm. I'd rather you be in the gym training developing learning the game than competing every single moment of every right. single day in like a, a tournament so yeah that was okay. gonna get to my point <laughs> yeah. actually Please. exactly my point Please. is um if your body is not able to fully recover now we're functioning off of dysfunction mm. right so you're going to play the next tournament the next seven games i guarantee there's going to be at least two games where you're like wow i should not be playing right now yep and like if your body's telling you that you probably shouldn't be playing right now right i have a great example also um, I had a kid, um, I'm not going to name his name, but amazing kid. And his parents were like, you know what, this year I think we're going to take off the year. We're going to take a gap year. Hmm. And with just that gap year, he's doing AAU, but he wasn't playing every weekend. He didn't play um, during the middle school year either. He, during that year, he gained 20 pounds. Gained 20 pounds. He was training with Dash which is an amazing trainer. And he was playing in men's league and he was playing uh, AAU, but select weekends only. Like he wasn't doing every single weekend. He went from like being like not ranked to like top 50 in one year. Yep. Yep. In middle school. Yep. Yep. And he didn't, he didn't have to play any of those tournaments if he didn't want to. Right. And then because of the up, development and was he ended so up great. In college, what, where did he? Is he okay, so now high school. Now he's starting as a freshman in high school. High school. Yeah. He went from like he wasn't going to start in high school to he's starting. Yeah. Like he's the main player, freshman year. Yeah. Just from one year of that, and this goes to show, like, for parents that are watching, it's like you don't need to play every tournament. No. You're just you're catching. It's you're playing catch up. Yeah. The whole summer. And then, you know, for me, uh, from coming from a performance standpoint, everything is consistency. So if I'm only going to see your kid twice a week, I don't want them. Because yeah. it's going to make me look bad and it's going to make the kid look bad. Yeah. 
um, and you can't recover fast enough if you're doing two days at the gym and uh, you have seven games on the weekend. Right. And then you're not doing recovery stuff. That's the other thing. That's the piece where I wish I had a place that was um, uh, nonprofit that just did recovery because like I feel like a lot of people can't afford it. So like if I, if everybody could afford it, that'd be amazing because yeah. then they would be um, ready for that next game all the time, yeah. you know. And and right now, you know, I would say seventy five percent of the kids don't do recovery stuff. Right. You know, they're not stretching, they're not going get red light therapy, they're not getting massage, they're not get, so all these things are built into my system to where like I'm literally calendaring it for you. You don't have an option. Yeah. So I only take now, especially I only take kids that are committed to three or four days a week because it's consistent. Mm -hmm. It's at a certain time and that's it. Yep. There's no ups and downs. I'm going to switch my time here, there. No, it's always the same time. Also, they need this for life. Like if you're, if you're going to be a pro basketball player, NBA player, you don't think your, your schedule needs to be like right. this. Right. Like it's like a job. So yeah. you got to treat it like a job. Like, this is when we're doing, we're eating breakfast. This is when we're going to train. This is when we're going to eat a shake. This is when we're going to do yoga. This is when we're going to get a massage. This is when we're going to yeah, eat again. Laid up. Yeah. So, like, when they see this on a calendar, they're like, whoa. Like, the, the that's a lot. The commitment. It's a though. commitment. Yeah. And so that's where you get into a school like yours. And it's like, we have more time for this stuff. Yes. And schooling is... Obviously, it's it's not optional, but like it's really, really um, demanding and you will see a commitment right away. And if not, that kid's probably not going to make it, mm -hmm. you know, yep. especially now when everybody can play yeah. like um, as far as skill wise, everybody can play. Yeah. So you have to do those those skill sessions like they just have to be there. So like if you're not doing that every single day, chances are you're not going to make it. And then you got to figure out where you fit within a system. Right. Right. And all that was our next that. thing, probably. It's just <laughs> like, on top of all that, which is very demanding, you have to figure out where you fit in a team. Yeah. And that's like the, the thing nowadays is where um, the kids don't understand that. And they're not looking at basketball in a sense of like, okay, I can help this team do, do this, this, and this, but I may not score that much. And they got to be okay with that. And you can, and knowing that you can still earn a scholarship that way, that's the key. I think it's that's the number what one way. Right. It's like, okay. You look at the top of the rankings and see these elite athletes and scores and, you know, but there are also thousands of other kids who go to college every mm -hmm. year who aren't the highest scorers that you say, like they do those. What What are some of those things that you're talking about of like uh, fitting a role in the team? What, which ones Let's that you see your it. NBA players that you work with? Yeah. What roles are they they are they doing? You know, yeah. let's take it back. Let's peel it back one time. The uh, best ability, the best ability is availability. <laughs> right. So if you're playing <laughs> seven games a weekend and you're not available, the college coach is gonna look at you like he's not playing this game. Why isn't he playing? Oh, he's got a bum knee or something. Well, overuse. Like you're yeah. playing seven games a weekend, like. There's, um, it, yeah. This is not longevity at all, yeah. right? This is very short term. He's going to die out in the second year of college. You see it all the time, yes. actually, yeah. uh, where the kid gets hurt and then they just keep getting hurt. Yeah. It's like that was from before when mm -hmm. they played too many games. Um, so, yeah, college coaches are going to look at that, though. Number one, first and foremost, is like, is he getting hurt a lot? Is he available? Like, is he reliable? Is he coming every day to practice? and to training and yeah. weight room and all these other things, they'll come in the weight room too. Now, I love the, the NBA coaches. They'll come to the weight room mm -hmm. and watch. Right. They'll sit there and watch and hawk you like, are you really doing your stuff? Are yep. you committed to this? If you're not doing that stuff, you're not, you're not gonna have a job, you know? And so to your point though, it's like those habits need to be built at a young age. Yeah. And like if those habits are built the right way, you're gonna see their number skyrocket, which I collect all my data. I know I, I do com combines now as a side business because everybody wants to know how their kid's doing. Mm -hmm. And if they're, 
not if their numbers aren't climbing every single year, there's something wrong in the system that yeah. they're using or their approach to what they're doing. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Um, so you've been able to work with MBA clients. Um, when was, who was your first MBA client, and um, how did you get that opportunity? Be- best story in the world. Um, Chris Copeland was probably my, that was my first MBA client, I believe. I had a bunch of overseas guys. His best friend ended up being uh, Moot. Um, I know it's Moot, but James Wright mm. is his best friend, and they went to Colorado together. I was training James Wright, which is amazing. He played in like 13 different countries. Um, I, I don't think I ever beat him one-on-one. He's like <laughs> really, really solid, good dude, and... Um, I was helping him a lot on his body. He was a really obsessed guy about his body. Mm. So like he would have a little back thing, I would fix it, we would do strength work. Um, he loved the workouts that I did. And then he introduced me to Chris, which was on the, like, the last leg of his career. Okay. Um, man, that was a long time ago now, but we're really, really close to this day. But Chris, like even coming into it, he's like, look, this is what I got going on. You just gotta get me, just get me to where I can get up and down for 20 minutes. Like, I don't even need a full game. I just need, because his body was killing him. And um, so we do that. He gets in great shape. Um, and then he started to um, put me with other guys uh-huh. that he knew. And so it was like word of mouth. And then it was like wildfire. Um, that's it, at the point where I was like at the top of Equinox as well. Mm-hmm. So like I was getting all these guys in. And um, he's like, you never thought about just like going on your own? <laughs> and I'm like, I mean, I think about it all the time, but like, you know, I have kids, I have a lot of kids. Um, so I had to have a very structured schedule and they would all come to me. And I was doing um, PT office at the same time with um, sports rehab. And that's when I met Chris. So that's how all that unfolded. I brought all my clients to sports rehab. And then the pan, actually right before the pandemic, crazy story, um, is I put myself in China, by the way, this is like a story on top of a story. So I literally was doing meditation one day and I brought myself to China and then I ended up going there to coach. Hmm. So I went from Equinox to China to train a team. And when I was, I literally was there. I was like, holy crap, 2017. Okay. This was before the pandemic. Gotcha. And then that happened, and um, and I was like, wow, I literally put myself here. Like, I already had seen it mm-hmm. before. It was crazy. Yeah. Anyway, so that happened, and I was training them, and I came back. I was working at Sports Rehab, and that's when I met Chris. And Chris Johnson. Johnson. Yep. Yes, I met Chris Johnson. And, um, and then he started putting me, he put me with Andrew Wiggins fairly early, Jared Vanderbilt really early. Um, a plethora of guys, but those are like the two guys that really propelled like over the last five, six years. Yeah. But um, so so yeah, that's kind of like how it started though. It was like from Chris and that maturation into like I was at Sports Rehab, actual rehab facility, uh, which was great. They got recovery there. They got everything they needed yeah. in one spot. Um, and then we moved out once once the pandemic hit. Everybody moved out of there. Uh, we were kind of working underground. I actually went and James Wright became my right hand when it comes to uh, hoops training. Uh-huh. So me and him just were like super underground. We had a gym and we had <laughs> 10 players. And this was like KJ Simpson. I uh, was with us, Christian Coloco, Cody Riley. We had like 10 guys and we just kept it at that. And yeah. nobody was allowed to do anything. Like we were like, if you, if you go out, like let us know. Cause like, we can't be around anybody right. that's like doing bubble. dumb stuff, yep. right? And so we kept those 10 kids for like a year and you just see like the, the growth was infinite. Yeah. Um, and then after that, um, Chris and me got into our gym that, that we're at now. This was like three years ago, I think, three or four years ago. And um, yeah, that's, that's how all that stuff matured. And, and now we have arguably one of the best gyms like in the world in my opinion, uh, as far as development, you know, you got it all in one place and it's, uh, you know, you're, it's the environment, the culture that's set there. It's it's work. Everybody's focused. Everybody's locked in. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Yeah, no, I love I love just going in there and just sitting down. You see me all the yeah. time. I just go and sit in the chair. It's like cause I just I know love, I, the hoops going on. Sometimes. Adam's training over here. And it's just like sometimes I think like Chris, he'll like look at me. I'm like I'm just sitting in the chair for like 20, 30 minutes just because I love basketball so much, yeah. you know. And and I used to uh, train on the side as well, mm-hmm. you know. And like I still have the love for like the structure of everything and um, and how he trains and. He, yeah. He's already looking at me. It's like, what's up? You know, I'm, I'm just watching. I'm not even working at this point. Yeah. I work right next to him. You know, my gym's yeah. right there. But I'm just watching because um, I rival what he does as well. You know, it's it's really, really amazing the work that he does too. Yeah. Um, and I think that even even when he looks over at me, like I'm locked in and he's locked in, it makes the environment like really, really synergistic. Yeah. And... Um, I feel like the players feel that too. Yeah, for sure. It's like now nah, we're serious in here. You know, like you're getting the best over here, you're getting the best over here. Yep. And like everybody can root each other on. We can talk to each other yep. from from my spot to his spot. Yep. So it makes it a very like family oriented type of thing. For and sure. um and it's it's very, very um it's like the unicorn of, of gym. You know, yeah. it's it's like something that has an aura to it, something that's different than everything else. Yeah. Um, and that's I love that about about me and Chris's work yeah. is like you rarely see two very, very high level uh, people on two different spectrums working that close to each other. Yeah. No, like physically, like you, don't, close, yeah. you don't see, so yeah, physically. <laughs> and, yeah. and where that gym, that area in the gym what it was before it was transformed into right. a NBA training basketball court and a, you know, high level of sports performance center, like literally from the bottom, like physically changing that space. Right. I can't, <laughs> to yeah, it I can't is. even. Like you, if you would have seen it before, I think I, think I actually have pictures of you what do? it was wow. before. Yes. Yeah, it was. And so, I don't know. So, uh, I introduced Chris Devon. Mm, and, okay. And that's how we got he got introduced to that space. I was like, got Chris, it. they have this whole area. Put your court right here and rock out. And so we I have pictures of it because we were like, how are we going to do this? Like, cause it yeah. was it looked like a storage room. It, right? it, it was a store. It, it was, was a storage. It was pretty much a storage room. It was yeah. a lot. It was a lot. But um, it's awesome what it is today and how it's, I know you wouldn't even know with with what you guys have done. No. With this and thing. I and I like how it, like it's secluded. Yeah. So players liked it, that part too. Yeah. It's like. Man, where is it? Like, I don't even know. Yeah, We're going go in the, the right, right door. door. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I go in the right door. So, like, when people come over there, I think they're attracted to that part, too. Yeah. It's like, it's like okay, I understand why you guys are, yeah. are back here. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all work. It's like a dungeon. And, and we love it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, the next part of our show um, is my Rushmore. Okay, your top four. We're gonna go with top four coaches, coaches, regardless of sport, regardless okay. of, uh, you know, sector of all time. Okay, who's your four? <sighs> any sport or just basketball? No, let's go. We'll go. I'm going across any field. You can go sport. You can go performance training. Okay. You can go Ooh. life coach. You can go Dang. any type of coach. Any to- any coach. Okay. Um, I think I have to go like. Number one all time, in my opinion, and it's never going to change, is John Wooden. Uh, he just set up the foundation for every coach. Like, even if in my field, like, uh, my philosophy, it it's, has some of his in it, yes. you know? And it's like, back then, he won so many championships in a row um, with so many different uh, role players and people you would never even heard of. Um, also, obviously, he had you know, the Bill Waltons and all that. But before right. that, he had nobody. Right. And he, he was winning he lost with for, nobody. Well, he lost for... He lost for a while. Nine years before yes. he had a winning season. Yep. And then he yep. ran off a couple of So, like, I think, I think it shows, you know, work, sticking with your situation, um, philosophy and what it did for his players, and then them carry it over in their life and probably their children's life and everything. Yeah. So, um, even coaches now. I mean, that was... How many years ago was that? 60? That's a 60, 70, yeah. Yep. So um, I think he's always going to be my number one. Uh, number two. There's no order to a, this, so just your top four. Okay. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, no oh, order right. to it, yeah. All right, just top four. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, I definitely I definitely love uh, Krzyzewski. Um, I think 
when it when we say the word culture, uh, you can't leave his name out mm -hmm. because he built that the culture of um, team. Yeah. Man, nothing's about the individual. It's all about the team and mm -hmm. um, our philosophy and and stick to it. And this is where you could go. And he kept his promise to hundred players. You know, hundreds yeah. of players. Right. Um, if you stick to this system and you work for each other and you learn how to play within a system, this is where it could take you. And I think that goes across the board and that's why he was on USA. Yep. And even the NBA guys listen to him yes. and consider him one of the best is because he's able to take all those personalities and bring them into the nest, yep. you know? And he cares so much and he has the also the military background. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if you look at any great coach, the structure of their life is just, it's very systematic. Yep. And, and I think it, it carries over through everyone. Um, I, I, I know that a lot of people are going to disagree with this, but I love Bobby Knight. Like, fair, it's fair. not only I have an experience with him where, like, he's got his hand on my neck, like, this guy is tough. Everybody should play like this. I had that moment with him where mm -hmm. it was like, an interactive one, but he wasn't at the choking same time, you. He was just uh, embracing you. I mean, hopefully. Okay. Yes, <laughs> yes, and no. All right, but um, I had that experience with him. But at the same time, I got to see him coach live. I think he he yelled so much that you knew he cared. And yeah. I had the same coach like in high school. Like he just yelled at if if they're not yelling kids, if they're not yelling at you, there's a problem, right? That means they they don't care or they gave up on you. If they're not yelling at you, they don't care. Yeah. Um, and I think he brought that to every player. And every player, if you ever see him yell at somebody, every player is like alert and looking him in the eye and like, okay, you're telling me this for constructive criticism. Yeah. You're not just yelling at me to go to the bench. Right. right? And you're going to tell me what I did wrong. Yes. Um, and I love that. I think that carries over to everybody too. And I think... Um, I think the last one, I might have to go with like a performance coach. I love, um, man, there's so many. I love, I'm gonna have to go with Louis Simmons. Um, I've always looked up to him from afar because he brought the dungeon weight room to data. So like he, he, the way he structured his program was he got all these, the strongest people in the world in one room. So mm -hmm. you'll see Olympians in there. You'll see, you know, these guys that you may see in like strong man, okay. they're all in his gym. It's in a dungeon and I think it's Ohio. Um, I think he's out of Ohio. Um, you'll see the rusty bars. You'll see the, the, the seats with all the chalk on it and just worn down. But you see the top strongest people in the world is in that gym. Rusty bars, all that love stuff, it. right? And I even love, when I go back east, I don't know if you ever go back east and you go into a weight room, the smell of it, it's like very old, yeah, I don't um, so. damp, you yeah. know. He brings that like dungeon feel to where like, I'm going to go crazy in here, mm -hmm. you know. And it's like just the environment that he works in is so like old school but at the same time he's using his scientific um, brain to bring all the numbers and the and the systems that he uses to why his guys are the strongest hmm. so he'll always take the data and say okay john doe is doing you know 400 pound bench press this is how he trained them for the last year we saw a two percent increase of strength. Mm. This is Ty Wilson. We trained him this way. And because of that data, we switched this up a little bit. It may be like two exercises out of a hundred. We switched these two exercises up. And because we got that data from here, we added this to Todd's program and he went up 10% this year. Dang. And then he'll take that data and then he'll move on to he's the strongest on. man in the world and be like, all right, we did this with this kid. You're, you're going to go up 10% this year. Wow. And the, and the strongest man in the world is like, 
no way i'm already the strongest man in the world and then they do the program you and the strongest 10%. man in the world went up 10 percent. the details man. it's all behind the details the numbers wow. um and how you can take data and use it to your advantage i think that back then when he was doing that he got hurt in his back and that's kind of like his story yeah on why he uses certain machines i even have one in my my gym that he specifically used for his back and when i had back problems it got me out of my situation wow. so i think him teaching me what i could do with data at a very early stage in training now i have numbers on all these guys that are in the NBA, I have all, all the kids that I was developing 15 years ago, I have all their data and what it looks like and how that matured into my system that I use now, that's 98, 99 percentile that it works, yeah. um, is vital. Because really? now I have, a, I have a, literally a collection you of data. A, you're a scientist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you're a scientist. And, you and I think just over time, like I became obsessed with that part and it was because of that coach. So I'll, I'll say that, like, he's a GOAT for me. Yeah. Uh, one of my, the people I look up to um, and why I use my, some of my systems. And obviously, I'm taking some of his workouts and, yeah. and bringing it into developing yeah. kids that you are in high school. the wheel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and now, you know, I see, you see my numbers. I have all my numbers online if anybody wants to, like, look at them. I have, like, combine numbers that these some of these high school kids that i've trained their vertical leaps and their you know three-quarter court sprint is higher than the guys that are in the nba hmm. so you can see how the training is developing yeah. and where it's going from it's a going performance to, to get better and better because you're able to use those numbers and adjust and bingo create. oh man bingo everybody yes. call adam uh so my <laughs> four my four coaches of all time john wooden's up there yeah uh for sure he's just uh the character building through basketball is like my goal overall goal is if i could, i can develop the character of a kid mm -hmm. with this game that we all have a passion for and love then i've done my job you know and yep. so just all the principles and um his style like i literally every year show the kids how to tie their shoes because john wooden showed them how to put on their socks and tie their shoes like yes. i think there's there's there is value in showing somebody life skills and how to do things. Um, so John Wooden, two. I'm going to have to go with uh, Tim Grover, man. Mm. Just the mentality that he's able to bring with the performance training. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, you know, he, of course, Michael Jordan, right? He had the, the performance training where this guy was, a, I think Michael Jordan's a freak athlete already and then whatever he was doing. Yeah. But it was the mental part that he's done with all of his clients that um man that that takes them to another level where they're able to just overcome injuries and become not even like you know when people overcome injuries they're like i just want to get back to where i was it was like those guys came back from injuries and they were better than what they were before right. um and just his whole mindset on how that works and being a cleaner and the, the mentality stuff so i like tim grover i love it uh love third it. I, I think, man, I'm going to go with Eric Thomas as a life coach. Uh, that guy, just how he speaks and the um, what he stands for and how he encourages, man, I could just listen to this guy talk all day and feel motivated to do whatever is in front of me. Mm -hmm. um, so I think coaching comes in so many different ways. And if somebody can speak to you to motivate you to do your purpose in life, mm -hmm. um, I think it's a, uh, that's like, I don't know. That's beyond anything that money can buy. Right. <laughs> and he Absolutely. has everything online for free. So you can listen to it. And um, so him and then, man, I'm going back to basketball. I believe I'm going to go with, I always get stuck here because there's so many good ones. I know. I'm going to go with John Thompson, man. Thompson. Great because coach. what he stood for and how he moved the needle for you know for black coaches specifically but for the time that he was a coach at Georgetown doing what he was doing the, the lives that he's changed when mm -hmm. he was there um, and his story through it all like mm -hmm. he was very selfless 
in every move that he made. It was for the bigger purpose. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, just, I read his book maybe a year ago and kind of opened my eyes to what it really was, right? We all saw mm-hmm. Georgetown and yeah. the swag and AI and all that, but yeah. what he really stood for and um, your purpose being bigger than just coaching the game right. and just even developing kids was a bigger purpose, a, a cultural difference that he was trying to make as a, a black coach. And Yeah, um, absolutely. So, yeah, those are those are my four coaches, man. That's a wait. I have I, ha- I have to say something. Please, two dark horses: mm-hmm. Phil Jackson, yes, and George Mumford. Ah, uh, uh, and I'm gonna tell you why. the The mental aspect is such a huge and pivotal part to not only a kid's development, but later in life when you get to a point where you feel like you're at a plateau. And like that's the only way you can go to make an increase of not only your performance but as a person. Mm-hmm. Um, I think those two guys are the masters of say less is more, yeah. and just teaching somebody how to find themselves mm-hmm. and how to bring their best self to a team setting. Yeah, and um, if you want to read two books. Look up those two guys. Yeah. Phil there, Jackson. The, Phil George Jackson Mumford. was on mine too. Though. He was the one I was struggling with between him and John Thompson. But mm-hmm. yes, I got to read the George. What's the George Mumford book? <sighs> I got to find it for you. Let's put it in the show notes. Karina um, Post here. Yes. All right. <laughs> yes. George Mumford. Um, uh, just for a little background, he's Michael Jordan and um, Kobe. All these guys, they use him as a mental coach. Ah, got it. Yeah. Okay. And they were he was for the teams, too, as well. It got wasn't it. just for for the player. Mm-hmm. He worked with teams. But he's the one pivotal uh, person when it comes to championships and the way that the player was thinking at the time. Yeah. And, um, and I love his story. Love it. He's, he's one of the, probably one of the, people I most look up to and I always end up going back to his work because there's always these keys in there that are just like he has so many gems you know and and less is more and everything won't come out of you until you look internal yeah and and I think that's a big thing when it comes to developing kids right now because they're looking external they're not looking internal it's like, oh, this kid is a great move. They go in the game, try to move, fail. Oh, but he could do it. Why can't I do it? Well, it's like you got to look inward. Like, what are, you, what are you doing to do that move the right way, mm-hmm. right? And they just kind of like, they're kind of like pointing fingers all the time. Yeah, like that self-accountability. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like, all right, how do I bring that out into my game? And it's not about anybody else. It really isn't. Um, any plateau that you ever got over, it was about looking internal, finding the the solution, and then attacking that solution with everything you have. Yep. You know. So. Uh, so this is the point where we flip the script. You're the interviewer now. Two questions for me. Anything in the world. What you um, got? I think just because I know you, I I wanted to talk about faith a little bit. Like, uh, if you are always been religious um Mm -hmm. and if so like when did it start and um how do you um stay with that philosophy in your training and your your life absolutely um so i grew up in the church okay pretty much been in church my whole life Mm -hmm. i would say um i've always had a great relationship with god Mm -hmm. i started understanding religion versus spirituality um, and relationship uh, yes. later in my life uh, when I so moved to Kansas was still with my family when I moved back to California um, I moved with my my biological father lived in his back house um, and it was the first time I was away from like my mom who was the one hey you go to church every Sunday right and so I didn't go to church for two or three years wow. um, still read my word every day still was praying but definitely wasn't living the lifestyle that went along with how I was raised and um, grew up. And so I always knew, I always had faith that God is my provision 
I know I can pray for stuff. I knew I had this, you know, I had the faith that God was there. And then understanding how to live that life, though, at the same time came yeah. right before I got married, actually. And it was a moment of, like, of, I just knew God was showing me, hey, you better live your life this way or it can right. go the other way. Um, and I, I committed, like, fully committed my life to God. I was 22, 3 in there where I was like, all right, let me actually live this out. And um, so... From that point on, I was 2010, 2011, 2011, I kind of, not kind of, I've just been focused on living my life the right way through my relationship with God. Right. I'm actually, I don't like religion. Religion is the practice of, um, like, the practice practices that you think you have to do to get close to God. And that's not what Jesus came for. Jesus is like, I'm here. Like, I've already paid for your sins. I've already done this for you. Accept my love. You know, I, I think that's the difference between Christianity and most religions is that right. most religions, you have to do something to receive this when Christ has already done it. And you just have to receive him mm -hmm. and his love and follow him. And so for me, it's just been building that. So the major thing I think that happened in my life that where through that time was fasting, actually. Mm. When I fast, this spiritual fast and it has you know it has health stuff that helps you it has all these other things all these other benefits right. but it was spiritual fast where god showed me core when i fasted for 21 days i have it written down i didn't know what it was it was uh but it was funny it was called the warriors this is before heritage christian was an actual school it used to be la wow. baptist it wow. said the warriors basketball uh, life skills, community service, strength and conditioning, everything that core is today. And it was called yep. the Warriors. Yeah. And then fast forward, wow, four or five years, Insane, right? I met Heritage Christian where it's the Warriors. The Warriors. And I'm building logo. this core program. And um, another one was I fasted and when I became an agent. Uh -huh. I didn't know if I wanted to become an agent, but that's what opened the door to, I was, I was working with pros, but that's what opened the door when I met Chris mm -hmm. and, um, that I, I fasted and I was asking God, where should I go if I want to be an agent? And yeah. showed me something and I'm in the gym and the next day I meet Rich Paul. Yeah, like immediately, <laughs> right? Yeah, like so literally, literally a week you're, later. You're putting yourself in the places that yeah. you want to go. I've and always had these um, visions. Yeah. I always have visions yep. of places and then I mm -hmm. have this like, oh, I've been here. Like God is showing me this. Yeah. Of course. And so yeah, of course. It, it happens literally every couple months. I'm like, oh. I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be God here. Told me yep. to be, and so, yep. and it's a it's a journey. It's mm -hmm. always I'm learning more. It's like you never you never get this right because God keeps. I got one good question. You speak in tongues? I have. I pray in tongues. In tongues, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. 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 Pray in tongues. Yeah, because I feel like that's something that has been in and out of my life for a really long time, um, and like really communicating with God and yeah. in another Romans eight twenty six. Language is, is is really intense. You're praying the things that you don't know what to pray for. That's an utterance, right? That yes. God gives us yes, to speak absolutely. to so, I'm just always yeah. interested if people, <laughs> if people actually practice that. And like, yeah. um, I always constantly try to do it, even though it's very difficult. Yeah. And you really have to be at it a lot and often, you it know. Is, it is. So. I, so spiritual journey is this, is that this is what I learned. So through fast, right? Mm -hmm. You take away food, water, or what, not water, you should have water, but uh, food, uh, social media, whatever you're fasting mm -hmm. from. And mm -hmm. then what I've learned through my fast is this is like, I'm so, I get so close and in tune with the spirit is telling me what God is telling me and what the Bible says, right? That when the fast is over, you're not supposed to bring all that stuff back. Mm -hmm. You're actually supposed to keep that stuff out. Right. And you just keep on pruning more and more of what your flesh wants to do, what this world stands for. Right. And instead, do what the Spirit is telling you to do. Right. And so that's what I learned from these fasts is like, keep on pulling off that stuff that you were, oh, let me stop doing this so I get close to God. You probably shouldn't be doing it anyway. Right. right. <laughs> and I so think, I think that's where people really get backtracked is like the enemy comes in like, oh, your fast is over. Go ahead and uh, eat this junk food. Right. Go listen to this music. Right. Go fill yourself with the stuff that you were doing right. before instead of just keeping it pruned and keep growing. I have a great uh, tidbit for that. Um, after all these fads and diets that are out there, everybody's trying to get skinny or, you mm -hmm. know, this one's for fat loss or this one's for muscle gain or 
if you look at the Bible, it literally has the diet right in there hmm. and the fasting, everything. Go look up tonight the Bible diet. Just go look it up. The Bible diet. They literally have everything there for you. And when you're supposed to fast, what meat right. you're supposed to eat, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. Because you're not supposed to eat meat all the time. But like, they will show you exactly when, where, what to eat. It's mm. insane. It's been there all along for <laughs> generations. Yeah. yeah. Love that. Yeah. Um, and then the, uh, the other question um, I think I have for you is um, within your business, um, where did you start to see the growth? Was it right away or is it gradual? And then how do you use uh, data to show what the progression looked like uh, within your teams, within um, students enrolling? Maybe you don't see them again, like retention, things like that. Yeah, uh, it grew, I, I want to say, slowly you know okay. we're in our ninth year now so we started uh -huh. with eight kids in the program okay next year after that was 18 then 28 then 36 mm. then 72 and then it dropped to 32 i had a really rough year <laughs> on purpose <laughs> or um or no no not really <laughs> not okay. really it was just it was a rough year um there was just a lot of chance when i had my first child Mm -hmm. um, it's actually when I first met Chris and I was getting to the agent stuff. Yeah. Um, I had um, some people who were working with me start their own thing. Yep. And so I had to like, all right, let me get to where I'm paying. You know, this is how I take care of my family. I have to make sure I had money to take care of yeah. my family. Mm -hmm. Let me get to where I know I can manage this yeah. properly. And so it went down one year, then went grew again, and then COVID happened. Okay. After COVID, during COVID, we even had kids in, and we had like 32 kids during COVID, which yeah. was awesome to maintain. That next year after that was 125, wow. 160. Now we're at 200. And so, um, yes, it grew steadily, and yeah. it feels like, you know, it just exploded, but I also feel like I improved. I, I started this as a hobby. I had kids right. who wanted to train and play basketball during the day. Yeah. I had a school, let's do this. I was still a full-time trainer, outside of school hours. That's how right. I made most of my right. money. Mm -hmm. And then when it got to the 72, it was like, oh, this is a business. Yeah. But I wasn't operating as a trainer and not as a business owner. Mm. And so yeah, I learned because that's when I fell on my head. Yep. And then that's when I restarted and said, okay, this is a business. Let me really mm -hmm. get this structure down. Let me get my corporation. Let me get my insurance. Let me get um, an HR department. Let me get all these yep. things. And then a couple of years ago, I had a business partner who invested into the business who brought that business side as far as back office accounting yep. hr attorney yep. all that those things that helped me focus on running and operating the business where right. i'm actually good at and so um that's where that shift happened um and as far as uh keeping so it's interesting i my strength and conditioning coaches they keep all that data we do um combine testing yes. every we do it every six weeks actually that's great and we assess that's on their great. sports skills training every six weeks as well so we have that data we haven't had to show it but uh, like listening to you is like there is a way to show this besides our kids going on to high school and doing well going mm -hmm. on to college like our results mm -hmm. are these kids are making it but uh to actually show it and how to improve it i mm -hmm. i i kind of didn't know what you were saying is like, hey, I can take this, I could tweak it a little and just make it like make it exponentially better. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. So um like mm -hmm. for instance, yeah, in my business, just doing that part, it took my players within a year to go from like two inches on the vertical to five. Wow. In one year. Yeah. That's a big jump. Oh, for sure. For yeah. sure. Just, just tweaking it. I got to like bet with one of my dads about. right now that their kids are gonna be dunking by the end this year, so he might be. There you go. Away. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> like I, there you go. I get a, a nice if you can there. guarantee those results, <laughs> yeah, then your program doubles, yeah. triples. Well, so know? that's the thing is that they do. They all leave dunking in athletic yeah. because yeah. of the commitment. So they, this is school. That's the unique thing about our program is, is they have to do is. it. Like mm -hmm. you said, they have to be here during the time. They yeah. have to do these things. And if they don't, guess what you're doing? You're running anyway. Like you're still doing right. some type of training to improve, you know, everything. Um, right. And so I've we've been, you know, we have that benefit. But to make it better, we do, we should 
be documenting and improving. So thank yeah. you for that yeah. question. That's yeah. a, well, I have systems in place too that, that I teach so you can actually track it. And yeah. there's computer systems and softwares that you can literally just enter the numbers. Even yeah. the kids. I, I have a system now that I'm with Campbell Hall. This is my second year using it. I use that Heritage too and now Campbell Hall where the kids enter the numbers. So mm -hmm. I don't even have to do that part anymore. Nice. Um, they enter the numbers, then I can literally look at graphs and wow. just watch it go here, here, wh wherever the kid is at the moment, um, and relay that to their parents. Yeah, you know, the technology like that. piece I gotta integrate. No, it's, it's like, amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Because I, I know it's, it's there, it's just... Well, 15 yeah. years ago, I was writing it. <laughs> so I have like binders at, at my house now. My wife's like, what are those damn binders doing? Get rid of them. And I'm like, well, one day I'm going to just sit there and put all this on the computer, right. which yeah, I'm probably right. not. Or maybe I will. Find somebody. That, you could probably find somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make yeah, it yeah. digital and send it on Fiverr, man. People, yeah. data input, yeah. like, for... Yeah, I did, I did that with uh, one of my assistants. Um, it was... It was a guy at the time, he did one, and then I had another assistant, she did one. Um, but there's just like books and books of just writing. Yeah. Um, but I have one more sure. for you. Three three books that you would recommend. I love, I like reading. So yes. Well, I need some new ones. This, I'm not going to add this into three, but you should be reading your Bible. It's a collection uh, of 66 yes. books. Yes. But uh, the, the other yeah. one, so I have actually have an order. So um, I do a lot of, I, I guess you call it life coaching. Um, I give people the, these books in order. Actually, one's an audio recording. It's not a book, but it's That's important. great. I'm driving it's a lot. Earl Nightingale's. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah, Earl yeah. Nightingale. The, um, yeah. Um, the Secret. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what's it called? The Secret to Success? Success, I think, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah, I love that book. I tell people to listen to that for a month every day. Yeah. Don't listen to yeah. nothing else. It right, will transform right. your mind. No, it will, so for sure. I start there. There's a book called Go for No. It's only 68 pages. What is it? It's Go for No. Go for No. Yes, and it's a Got it. it's a story about um, not being afraid to hear no. It's a sales book. I love it. It allows people to not like to understand that no's bring you to an ultimate right. yes yep. of what you're really trying to do, and yep. don't stop. And kid, I feel like kids out there watching like. They struggle with that right oh, now. Oh, for sure. No, no. So they, like, they hate they hate losing. They hate mistakes. I heard no a million times on the way where I was trying to get you probably right. did too. It's like <laughs> it's part of life. I love know? hearing no because I'm yeah. like, oh, God has something better for me. Cool. Yeah. Like God's it, protecting me from something that I didn't need. That and also I feel like it's a, another driving point to like maybe I need to work harder and maybe I need to figure out something else yes. to find that yes. You know, like I was missing something there. Let's go back and work on that so mm -hmm. that we get the yes the next time. Yep. And maybe it's not. Maybe it's a no next time. But at least I tried. Absolutely. Know? And then the last one is um, The Compound Effect by uh -huh. Darren Hardy. Um, it's a system built for how to teach you to be disciplined and create habits. And Love it. it is what, after my big fallout, I read that book and became super productive. I, yep. I know how to book my day out where I'm just productive and yeah. it gives you some great, he's, um, he's the editor of success magazine. So he's interviewed every major CEO person who has success pretty much in the world. Yeah. And so he's put them all in one book, um, with stories and, um, a system, right. Mm -hmm. To, um, create habits. That's the number one determiner determination of your success is the habits that you have. And so I give it to, and then there's one after that. I'm glad we talked about that though. Yeah. And then there's the uh, entrepreneur roller coaster comes right after the compound effect is by the same author. And it mm. shows you those same habits and how to implement them in your business, but also gives some crazy business advice. Like once again, that's how I modeled. I'm before. on it. And I'm on yeah, it. the Darren Hardy stuff, man. Um, Hardy. But that is, that's the cycle of books that I send people through. If they're on a journey to better themselves. Yep. Um, Karina. Perfect. So it's her right here. Yeah, who's, yeah, uh, she, she's on this and literally, Mm -hmm. 30 days she was she's like doing what she dreamed of doing yeah like she's freaking taking pictures of method man and at queen latifah's event and 
NFL players. Like mm-hmm. she's literally living I her dreams because we just like, hey, let's let's do this. Like this is right. your goal. This is how you get there. Let's do it. And it's right. it's a uh, and it, it it you do you actually get to more than what you want to do. Right. By, Following as like absolutely so no, well you are everybody's got to commit to a plan yes. right yeah. or like uh, I like Tyson's quote where you like you always got a plan so you get like smacked in the mouth right yeah. and it's like <laughs> that's part of um, your development you yeah. know you got to get smacked in the mouth a bunch of times that's where my Instagram all my handles Todd has a plan that's what it comes from is that gotta have a plan it, I have a it. I have a plan for myself but also. I can help you with whatever plan you want. You want to be a division one player? I have a plan for you. You want to be, uh, you know, you right. want to be an agent? Hey, right. I know how to help you do that. Now right. I know somebody. If you want to be a performance trainer, go see Adam. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, do you want to, like, um, what do you want for yourself? Some people is, like, can't get out of their own way. Yes. Oh. The, sometimes they, they never do. But the whole goal is to plant seeds. Mm-hmm. Somebody else does the water and God does the growing. So eventually they'll get there. But... You have to Love learn that. that too. Is that sometimes when you're trying to help somebody, you have to uh, I call it release them to the game. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, I've given you everything that I've been shown to give you. Now you got to go do it. They got to want yeah. it. There has there has to be a chip on their shoulder. You're giving you them the bag. That. Huh? That's it. They just got to believe it. That's what this show has started to give the game away for free. Like the what he just told you guys is the the blueprint. You want to be a Division One athlete? He mm-hmm. just gave you the blueprint for free. You know, like. This is what this show is for, is that Mm -hmm. it's up to you to grab it, take a hold of it, get the mentors in your life or the people in your life, your circle, to uh, get to where you want to be. It's here. It's not a secret. (laughs) It's right here. So, And when when coaches, I feel like when coaches are telling kids uh, what they're bad at or what they need to get better at, like that's their chance to listen and work on those things, Mm -hmm. you know, not run away from them. Right. You can't run away from your problems. <laughs> and and we're giving you solutions. Yes. And and if you have dedication and you have that want to do it, then you get to your goals and your plans and everything that your bag that yes. you uh, give them, you know. Yep, absolutely. Uh you got a 24 second shot clock. Everybody goes over, but whatever. 24 second shot clock. <laughs> Let the people know where they can find you, what you're working on or just a message that you have for the people. Okay. Um well, what I'm working on right now is to open a facility that um, is bringing in, you know, technology to track um, X, Y, and Z, wh- whether it's, you know, your vertical, whether it's biomechanics, whether it's um, are you sleeping enough, um, wearables, like we're going to be doing a lot of studies uh, shortly um, with especially young young athletes, you know, uh, high school, college, um, some pros I've already done some, some studies with, but I would say that's the next move uh, for me to make. And you should be seeing that probably within the next year. Um, I do have a book um, online. If you go to q24training.com, you can find uh, my book. You can find um, classes that are going to be happening uh, training sessions that are online. Uh, you can alf- also find my programs. Um, I have two systems out, Foundations 1 and Foundations 2. I have an app. It's called Q24 Training. Uh, so if you go on um, Apple, you can find that. Um, I'm pretty much across social media. Everything is Q24 Training. So whether it's Twitter, uh, TikTok, um, you name it, it's probably Q24 Training. And also go to my website, uh, differentcombine.com and you can find all of the testing results we've done over the last three years uh, when it comes to combines in California um, and pretty soon we're going on the road and I'll be doing some high, other high schools uh, around the nation um, and you can find those results and how they add up to the best athletes in the NBA. Um, and what their combines look like when they went to the NBA. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, thanks for talking with us. This was awesome. Yeah. Had a great experience. I appreciate you. Yeah, appreciate you, yeah, brother. My guy. Yeah, man. We got to do this again. Appreciate probably, you. But man. yeah. Thank you again, brother, for uh, coming You're on welcome. the show. I'm blessing us, man. My uh, pleasure. We'll see you guys next time. Peace.